friends. Good afternoon to all of our friends. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to Zoom yet again. I know many of you are suffering from Zoom fatigue, but I'm going to tell you, we have such a treat today, and I'm very proud and happy to be with you. Of course, I am Andre Spicer. I'm the administrator of the Access, Equity, and Acceleration Unit within the Division of Instruction. And again, very happy to have you joining us for our Brown Bag Equity Series. And before we get started, I just want to recognize a few of the folk who put this all together to make sure that we had a purposeful and meaningful and successful time together. Uh, we have Alva Posada of the Education Equity Compliance Office, Civil Ward, Contract Administrations and Procurement, Julie Hall, Educational Equity and Compliance Office, Dr. Judy Chasen, Human Relations, Diversity and Equity, Dr. Michelle Woods, Access, Equity and Acceleration, Dr. Jamila Gillenwaters, Access, Equity and Acceleration, Natalia Searchwell, Specialist, Academic English Mastery Program, and Ms. Murtis Williams, Academic English Mastery Program in AEA, and Danielle Evers. And of course, under the leadership of our Chief Academic Officer, Allison Towery. I have to tell you, we have a, a special treat today to launch our second year of the Brown Bag Equity Series, none other than Dr. Tyrone Howard, not a stranger to any of us as educators, but I wanna tell you a little bit about him before he comes on. Uh, Dr. Tyrone Howard is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. Dr. Howard is also the inaugural director of the UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families, which is transdisciplinary consortium of experts who examine academic, mental health, and social and emotional experiences and challenges for the California's most vulnerable youth populations. He's also the director of the UCLA Transformation of Schools, which serves as a thought partner for districts like ours, counties and states to pursue whole child, whole community approaches to school systems improvement. Professor Howard has published over 85 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and technical reports. He has published several best-selling books, among them, Why Race and Culture Matter in Schools and Black Male, Peril and Promise in the Education of African American Males, and his two most recent books, No More Teaching Without Positive Relations and All Students Must Thrive, Transforming Schools to Combat the Toxic Stressors and cultivate critical wellness have become must reads for all educators. And I'm currently reading All Students Must Thrive myself, and I have to tell you, pick that up. Pick that up. It is an absolutely phenomenal read for today's educator. Dr. Howard is considered one of the premier experts on educational equity and access in the country. Dr. Howard is also the director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA which is an interdis interdisciplinary cadre of scholars, practitioners, community members, and policymakers dedicated to examining the nexus of race, class, and gender of school-age youth. A native and a former classroom teacher of Compton, California, as am I. I never let the opportunity go away without saying that both Brother Howard and I are from Compton. Uh, Dr. Howard was named the recipient of the 2015 UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award which is the campus's highest honor for teaching excellence and was named an American Educational Research Association Fellow in 2017 for his exemplary research on race and equity. During the last five years, Dr. Howard has been listed by Education Week as one of the 60 most influential scholars in the nation in forming educational policy, practice, and reform. And I can tell you personally from actually uh, researching a lot of Dr. Howard's work, even this biography doesn't give him justice. Please give him a warm LA Unified welcome. None other, Brother Tyrone Howard. Thank you, Brother Spicer. Always good to see one of my Compton homeboys doing well and that you are. They always said we couldn't do much. They didn't know. They was trying to bury us, but they were burying seeds. And so here we are, the, the manifestation of that. So always good to be in the presence and honor of my, uh, my folks, all the LAUSD warriors and champions and fighters for our young people. It's always an, an honor and a privilege to, to be in your presence and, and to be able just to impart some of the, my thinking on these issues and these topics as they continue to come about. 
I definitely want to um, sort of take us in a slightly different direction today because I'm continuing to see some, some real challenges before us and challenges that I think that require us to do the work we've always done, but also to step back for a minute because I do want to remind us that we are living in the midst of a global pandemic. And I just sometimes when I say those words, I don't know that we, we, we really are really fully sort of understand the gratitude, gratitude of what that means. So what I'm doing in these moments is taking time out to kind of be a little bit reflective. So I'm going to engage in the chat for a few minutes, if you all don't mind. Uh, you know, I start off with always with my big gratitude, my attitude of gratitude, a big thank you for what you do. But if you don't mind, would you take just a few minutes, please, and put in the chat for me, uh, what is it that you are grateful for uh, in this moment? As you think about everything around you, who and what are you grateful for? I think we need to start sort of speaking out on those people, those circumstances that we are grateful for. So just go ahead and put some, there you go, my health and family, family and friends, there you go. Just put it out there. We just need to make sure we really hold on to and recognize and speak on the issues, the people, the circumstances of what we are most grateful for right now. And I say that because uh, it's important for us to really recognize the preciousness of life the, the, the fragility that is our, 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 our families, um, the fact that sometimes we get into these ruts of complaining about our jobs, but let us be grateful for the fact that we have jobs because there are millions of people out there today who do not have jobs. Um, we, we complain about our loved ones at times, but let us be grateful for the fact that many folks do not have their loved ones anymore in their lives because of this pandemic. So I just want us to really just appreciate this moment and be grateful uh, of, of what we have in our presence because the very things that you all have stressed here, family, faith, friends, uh, are the very things that are going to get us through this time. Um, these are trying times to say the least. Um, I know I have had some moments where I'm just like, this is, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this whole pandemic situation we are in, but, but know that we will lean on those very sources that have gotten us through these times will ultimately carry us through to the other side. So definitely just make sure you give your shout out, let the folks know that you're grateful for them. I think that's so important to not take these individuals for granted because they matter. And I also would stress to us that I want us to also be mindful of the fact that some of the very people and some of the very circumstances that you all just named uh, that are so fundamental to who we are, who are so vital to our humanity, who are so critical to our day-to-day -day survival in many ways we must recognize that the students that we are serving do not have those people in their lives. And so if we step back for a moment and thought about what would my life be like if I did not have certain family members, if I did not have certain friends, uh, if I didn't ha did not have my faith, what would our lives look like? I know for me, my life would not look anywhere close to what it resembles today. And so the bottom line is one of the things that really is tragic yet all too real is that far too many of our students don't have those core fundamental pieces in their lives, but they still try to be the best that they can be. So let's remember that as we, we do this work. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. Let me go one more step in the chat. Uh, you just told me who you were thankful for in this moment. Let me now pivot it to work. Uh, I want you to give me just a few names, a name or two in the chat of people you are grateful for in your workspace. Who are the folks that you work with that you are grateful for? Let's put some names in the chat because in this moment, we need to be recognizing our partners, in crime, our coworkers, our colleagues who make our work, make our time. Thank you, there you go, they're coming through. I see Elsa, I see Laura, I see Robert, Miss Aguilar, the Knox team, office staff, LD East getting shout out, love me some LD East. I see Central out there. Uh, I see uh, LD West, got a lot, mad love for LD West. Uh, yeah, let, let folks know you appreciate them because th this work is only able to be done when we are in collaboration with each other. And so um, continue to shout out, show your love to your team. Don't let them feel like they are not seen. Sometimes we don't realize that we are the persons that make other people's works uh, even more uh, doable than it is. Uh, a lot of shout out for the LD West Sosa team, AMP team. I see you out there. PLS team, one of a kind. Come on now, keep them coming. Jefferson, South LA, all the directors there. We got to show love, folks. We got to show love. We got to show love because in this moment, Oh, somebody shouted me out. Thank you. I see that. In this moment, it's important for us to lean on each other because no one will get through this process alone. So I want to just shout out, shout out all of you for doing this work. And for some of you out there who are doing this work, I, I, you, need, you deserve a little extra shout out. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You know who you are. 
um, I'm grateful um, in this moment that um, I do not have school-aged children. I'm grateful that my four children are all grown and employed. Thank, thank God they got jobs. But just because they have jobs don't mean they need your house. That's another matter. But they all have jobs. Uh, but I cannot imagine if I were, um, if my children were still school age. So I know there's a lot of you who are out there who are on this call right now who have school age children. And you all deserve a major, I mean, major shout out because I cannot imagine trying to do the work that you all do from home or even partially at home, partially uh, at, at your job, and, and also trying to manage young people. I don't care the age, if they were high schoolers, if they're middle schoolers, and God bless you, if you've got some elementary school age children that you're trying to also stay on top of their academic concerns, your job, God, God bless you. Because I, I, cannot, I, cannot, I cannot imagine you get special, special shout out for me. And I know there's a lot of folks out there you're juggling a lot. You're taking care of your kids. You're taking care of your students. You're taking care of your, of your staff, your team. You're taking care of, of, of your, your parents. You're taking care of other family members. It is hard. And, and look, I love my family, but let's be frank for a second, folks. There have been times where I'm, I felt like, you know what? If I don't walk outside and take a deep breath and take a walk in the neighborhood, uh, it's not going, going to go well because as much as we love each other, we all do well when we have a little bit of separation from each other at the same time. So I know for those folks who uh, are in it all day, every day, uh, just thank you. And I just think that we just need to just have this time to say that because you can love your folks, but that don't mean that they don't get on you, as my mama would say, my last nerve sometimes. So nonetheless, thank you, thank you, thank you um, for what you do. Let's kind of get into this conversation um, about equity. Um, I want to sort of frame it around a couple of different sort of ways. I continue to go to different school districts, and I have to make this uh, sort of distinction that, that I think lots of folks are still not always understanding. And it's really one centered around the fact that equality does not equate to equity. They're not the same. They get used interchangeably. And it bothers me because I think inherent in this notion is that somehow the disparities that we see with student outcomes is a, is a byproduct of effort, is a byproduct of, of concern for children's education, is a byproduct of, of, of whether or not they want it or not enough. And I'm going to have to keep pushing. I'm going to encourage you to keep pushing on this notion of equality and equity being the same because I think they're very fundamentally different kinds of approaches. And I'm also getting a little bit um, worried about the fact that equity is being used so frequently, and I think in some cases, oftentimes being overused. But I think equity is bolder. I think equity is brash. I think equity is much more pointed. And I think if we really want to get to the heart of what it means, I think we have to think about equity says that we will meet people where they are. So what does that mean? We meet people where they are because equality operates from the standpoint, as you all know, and just keep stressing this to your staff, keep stressing this to your teams that equality operates from the same point that everybody gets the same thing. And we know if we gave everybody the same thing, we would have what? More inequality. So part of what I have to try to impress upon folks is that if, if we're really serious about doing this work around education differently, that we can't say that we are engaging in equality as equity because again, not the same. Uh, I try to give more and more examples to help folks understand this because folks still seem to miss the mark when folks say, well, tell me, explain to me how they're different. And I oftentimes say, remember that, like, for me, I've got four kids, love them all. Um, but I recognize that they have different needs. And what I give to one, I would not give to the others. Um, my middle son was always the handful, always had to sort of speak his mind, always had to push the boundaries. So when he had to be disciplined, that was a very different kind of discipline I would give my daughter or my older sons. Different children require different kinds of interventions, different kinds of supports, different ways of communicating, different ways of manifesting our care and concern for them, okay? Moreover, I would also stress that equity says people get what they need. You have to meet folks where they're at. Um, and for you all as leaders, you know what that means. Uh, the thing I admire so much about leaders is that you have to be armchair psychologists. You have to be armchair uh, uh, quarterbacks. You have to be able to read the room quickly because the ways in which you interact with your staff are not the same. I know it right now because I've got a, staff, I've got a team of about, what, 35 people, and there are different ways I have to respond to people. I've got one person who needs a lot of my time and attention, and I have to constantly be present for her. 
I've got another another person on my team who is very much hands off, and I have to sort of respond in a very distant, distant, different manner. So equality is always about sort of giving everyone the same, but this one size fits all approach is not what is needed in this moment. So I believe that equity, like I said, I think is bold. I think it's brash because it's about fairness. It's about uprooting disadvantage. Now, some people will say, well, you know what? Well, if you give some people more than you give others, that's not fair. And I always respond to that by saying, well, the reality is this, folks. Uh, racism is not fair. Uh, gender bias is not fair. Um, transphobia and homophobia is not fair. Uh, yet far too many of our, our folks that we serve deal with those kinds of realities on a day in, day out basis. And the bottom line is equity seeks to somehow respond to that or uproot that or somehow dismantle that. So let's be clear about the fact that equity is not about fairness because we're not playing the fair game. It's about recognizing that we all don't start from the same place. We don't all have the same advantages. We don't all have the same opportunities and how we can think about schools in such a way that we are just boldly unapologetic about we can give more and need to give more to some of our, our students and sometimes more to our staff than we do to others and be okay with that. Because at the end of the day, we're all starting from different places. We've all had different sets of obstacles and challenges before us. And the goal with us is to try to figure out how can we as leaders begin to somehow eradicate some of those challenges, okay? So the question then becomes, then what is at the core of equity? And before I move into the next uh, phase of what I think is at the core of equity, let me just say this, because I'm going to offer some areas of, of, of where we can be more equity-minded in our schools. But I can give you strategies. I can give you areas from now until the end of the year. And I don't think those strategies and those approaches really matter much at all until we deal with mindsets. And one of the hardest things to do in this work, and you all know this, I feel like in many ways I'm preaching to the choir, but one of the most challenging things to do in this work is to try to somehow challenge certain mindsets. There are just certain mindsets that we have to consistently deal with of the adults, I'll say this, of the adults, because the young people I maintain are not always the biggest challenge. And I've said that before, many of you have heard me say it, that the biggest challenge for many of us is not always the young people. I believe that one of our biggest challenges rely, uh, sort of rests with our adults, how we change mindsets. How do we change mindsets where we can begin to really try to convince, persuade, cajole people to understand that the students that they are serving, and I use that word always very deliberately, is really important because if you don't see the students as potential learners, then you're never going to see them as actual learners. If your mindset is such that you only sort of see young people from the standpoint of what they don't have, then you'll never see what they do have. If you see students from the standpoint of where they fall short, you never see where they're reaching goals and then some. If you frequently see students from the standpoint of the, their families don't have X, Y, and Z, you'll never recognize the things that those families do possess. So one of the main things you can stress on an ongoing basis with your staff is, look, you have to see the best in young people. You know, one of the things that frequently gets me really up in arms is this idea of um, grit. And I go to lots of schools and I hear folks say, yeah, we need to teach these young people how to have more grit. And I know this all emanates from the book by Angela Duckworth. And I've been saying for years, I've still not seen her. You all know I'm looking for Angela Duckworth because we need to have a conversation. And that conversation is going to start with the fact that how dare you suggest that we need to teach poor children that they need to have more grit. I'm still on this because I hear more people using this term grit and it continues to just burn me to no end. The idea that we have to teach poor children grit to me is just, just woefully, woefully wrong. Uh, it's, 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 it's borderline unprofessional. I would say it's borderline unethical. And I think in many ways it's downright immoral because I would argue with every fiber of my being that the very children that you say we need to teach more grit to oftentimes possess more grit in their pinky finger than some of these folks possess in their entire bodies who say that they don't have grit. Don't tell me kids don't have grit when they manifest their brilliance and resilience and, and, and persistence every single day to log on to a screen, to show up to school in the face of adversity to get work done when they have all these different challenges before them. So please stop me with the grit because we don't need to teach kids grit. They already possess it. We need to just create the platform and the circumstances and the environments in our schools to allow their brilliance to manifest through their grit. That's what we have to do is get out of their way and stop saying what they don't have, but see what they do have. And I take this from personal because again, when I talk about kids who grow poor, that's my upbringing, that's my neighborhood, that's my reality. Uh, and I would also be willing to bet that's the reality for a lot of you as well. 
So mindsets matter. The sort of mental approach that you have is so, so, so important because I maintain that our young people are constantly in the, in the mode of trying to tell us, show us, demonstrate to us their brilliance. The question is, do we have the mindset to allow their brilliance to manifest itself? So important. If there's one thing we can stress is that mindsets matter. How do you see young people? Because who you see them as and how you see them will have a huge impact on what they ultimately become. I want to stress that point over and over again. I say that because I continue to have conversations um, with, with lots of educators, and I wish I had put the slide here, about some of the really key attributes about this generation of young people. Let me just kind of talk to you real quick about this. Generation Z are the group of young people that many of us are, are educating right now. Generation Z are the young people who were raised, I mean, who were born between the years of 1996 and 2010. Generation Z, okay? Stay with me real quick on this one. So Generation Z, this is a big equity issue. Generation Z, children, by and large, by and large, have a couple of ways of how they see the world, generally speaking. Not all, but many of them. And I'm, tell me if you, if you agree with this. So for many Generation Zers, one of the things that matters is, why do I have to do something? So we need to explain why things have to be done, because this generation of young people need to know why I need to do it, okay? That's one. Number two, a common theme for many Generation Zers is, what does this have to do for me? What does this have to do with me? So how does this matter to me? So why do I have to do it? How does this relate to me? The third thing is, um, how am I going to use this in the future? So for a lot of kids who say, why do I have to do geometry? Because I'm not going to do math once I'm out of high school. So A, why do I have to do this? How does it relate to me? How will it benefit me in the future? And then the fourth thing is, how much time? is this going to take? Because if it takes too long, then I may not do it. Okay, keep those four thoughts in mind because this is mindset, this is equity. When you have a generation of young people who believe that, you know, you need to explain to me why I have to do it. You need to explain to me how it benefits me and you need to tell me how much time it's going to take because if it takes too much time, I may not just do it. So just think about those three factors for a second. Now, let me tell you how generational divides come into being, okay? Because I think this is one example of where we don't see the sort of the brilliance of our young people. Our young people are of the opinion, again, I just want to re reinforce these points. Why do I have to do this? How does it benefit me? How long will it take? Okay, generational divide. My mother used to have a saying when I was growing up, and many of you will know exactly what I'm saying. I need you to finish this statement for me. My mother would always tell us that kids are to be seen. I'll wait for the chat. There you go. All you come. There we go. Okay, kids are to be seen and not heard. So many of y'all had the same kind of upbringing, upbringing that my mom had, that, I mean, that I had, right? Kids would be seen and not heard, okay? So stay with me for a second on that. Kids would be seen and not heard, which meant that young people could not participate in grown folks' conversations. Because if you did, what might happen? Uh, I won't say what would happen in my house, though, because I don't know what the statute of limitation is. There you go. Thank you, Ms. Watkins. She said smack, nothing good, right? Smack, spank, and all. We all grew up in the time. I don't know where CPS was, but the CPS was around. They wasn't coming to our neighbors. But bottom line is this. It wasn't a good outcome, right? So stay with me on this as I finish this point, right? So the bottom line is we are of a generation where we were taught that kids would have been seen and not heard. If you did speak in the presence of adults, it was not a good outcome. Folks, I have to tell you right now, we are in the midst of an era where we have young people who believe not only will I be seen, but I also will be heard, right? And that is the byproduct of the young people we are raising. And if we want to criticize them, we need to stop short of that because guess what? We raised them. We gave them the voice. We gave them the empowerment. We let them be seen and heard because we feel like in lots of ways when we were younger, we were not seen and heard, right? I still always tell the story when my mother comes to my house, she still can't figure out why there's so much negotiation between me and even my grown kids. Why, why, why are you telling him to take out the trash, but he's telling you he'll do it when X, Y, and Z happens, right? She's like, just do it. There's no negotiation. There's no back and forth. But the bottom line is we are of a generation that we were not given voice. Now we have empowered young people where they have more voice and agency than ever before. And then they walk into classrooms and teachers ask them to do things and students feel like, you know what, why? <laughs> Explain to me why I have to do what you're asking me to do and tell me how it benefits me, and tell me how long it's going to take. Then we have culture class, generational class, right? 
when we were younger, we had to do things because our parents said so. That's why. And we would never even ask why, because if we asked why, that was oftentimes fraught with problems. I raise this because as we start to look at the mental mindset that so much of what happens in our schools is that our adults are so content on control, control, control of their young people. And the more you try to control young people, the more young people are going to let you know, I will not be controlled. I will not be told what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And I think the more we start to understand that we have to relinquish control with young people, the better. Because this group of young people, generally speaking, generally speaking, feels like I am not someone who has got to be your puppet. I am not someone who you have to tell what to do, how to do, when to do it. So mindset matters. And thank you so much, Sophia. A colonized mindset that you are to be watched, you are to be controlled, you are to be sort of kept in line. And many of our young people say, the more you try to keep me in line, I'm going to do just the opposite. One of my favorite little books that I have lots of my pre-service teachers read is a book by Carla Shallaby called Troublemakers. And why I love this book called Troublemakers is, is because Carla Shallaby says that the very students that we label as troublemakers are some of our most creative, our most innovative, our most thoughtful, and our most persuasive young people. And that in many ways, she describes these troublemakers as the canaries in the mind. And the canaries are in the mind telling us that this learning environment does not work for me. And to be told, it does not work for most of y'all either, but y'all just tolerate it more than I'm willing to tolerate. And she says we have to begin to listen to the quote unquote troublemakers, because if we hear how they see school, they, would, might, they might begin to enlighten us in some ways that we've not been enlightened before. Because so much of schooling is about staying in the box, walk a certain way, talk a certain way, behave a certain way, think a certain way, communicate a certain way. And if you don't do that, we label you as a troublemaker. And lots of our young people are telling us, I don't fit in your box. Lots of young people are saying, I don't think and talk and process the way that you want me to think and talk and process. So therefore, I'm going to boundaries. And I know for me, um, when I read Carla Shalaby's book about troublemakers, it takes me back to the students I had who oftentimes I thought or I labeled as troublemakers. And some of those students oftentimes say, I will sabotage this classroom if you don't choose to see the humanity and the potential in me. And some of them say, not only will I sabotage the classroom so that I will not learn, I will sabotage this entire classroom so that no one learns in this classroom. If we are honest with ourselves, we've all had those students. And we are quick to point the finger at the students as being the problem, but rarely did we, rarely did I, look at where could I be better um, as a teacher. And some of us, thank you so much, Ms. Robinson, were troublemakers ourselves because we saw something that wasn't right in the environment and we would try to bring justice to the way this work played itself out. So what can equity focus on? Once we get mindset in place, I think there's at least five areas that we can start to think about. Let's start to talk and think first about curriculum because more of our young people continue to tell us that they still sit in classrooms with the content that they gain access to doesn't look like them, doesn't sound like them, doesn't speak to their experiences, doesn't talk about their history, doesn't have family arrangement that they can relate to, uh, the University of Wisconsin puts out a report every two years on the diversity of textbooks and trade books in schools, and they still find that 75% of all textbooks and pieces of literature that are used in school either depict either white children, white families as the primary source, or animals. White people are animals. Kids of color in a district like LAUSD, over 85% of our kids are kids of color, and the fact is the matter is that they're still coming into contact with content that does not reflect them is unacceptable in 2020. There's too many ways we can find equity in what our students have access to with regard to the curriculum that they engage in. Too many outside sources, too many online references. We have to do a better job to make sure our students see themselves reflected in what they are learning. At the end of the day, our curriculum should be windows and mirrors, meaning that windows where our students can look out and learn about the world around them but at the same time, our curriculum should also be mirrors where our students can see themselves reflected in what they have to learn. So we want to make sure that we have situations where our students are, in, are able to access themselves. Sorry about that. I think I lost my slide. There you go. Where they can see themselves. Curriculum matters. Um, you all have heard me talk extensively about this second bullet point, which is discipline. I think we still can do, need to do, have to do a better job with regard to discipline because we still see a disproportionate number of our students who are being pushed out are black students. Despite the fact that black students are only, what, seven, eight percent of the district, there's still about a third of the kids who are being suspended. What we have seen is out of school suspensions have decreased, that's great, but we see in school suspensions have increased, that's not great. 
and we still see disproportionality. Uh, I'm still hearing and seeing cases where even in the virtual space that kids are being sort of muted, pushed out. Um, we need to have a, a real hard conversation about what this virtual space looks like. Uh, I could, we could have a whole conversation on that, but let me just make two quick points on the virtual space. Well, let me make one point on the virtual space because this is what's really bothering me. Um, folks, we need to stop fighting kids over these cameras, okay? Um, I just don't think that is the hill that we should be dying on. I don't know what the district policy is. I don't know what the school-wide district policy is. But stop fighting these kids over the cameras being on. Why do I say that? Because I'm hearing too many kids being disciplined, pushed out, kicked out of Zoom because they don't have their cameras on. Stop it. Let me tell you why. Number one, Zoom has now created a way where you are basically in people's houses, okay? You are in people's houses. And there are lots of folks who operate from the standpoint that I only invite my family and friends into my household. And y'all are not my family and friends, they might feel like. And so therefore, you do not get access to my household. I, com I completely respect that. I'm not going to fight kids on that. I think we should, be, we should be fair enough to say we would like to have cameras on, but if you cannot, that's okay too. So not only is it in many ways an invasion of privacy for some folks, but for many of our students, they're like, I don't want you to see what I got going on in my house. I don't want you to see who is in my house. Uh, I don't want you to see the condition that my house is in. All fair and legitimate points because sometimes we as the adults feel the exact same way. Let me go on one step further with this point about the cameras because we also have to recognize that, look, I can tell you how many times folks say, I'm having a bad hair day. I'm having a bad grooming day. I'm still in my pajamas. I don't want to be seen. Bottom line is that's fine. The fact of the matter is at least the child has logged on and is at least making an attempt to learn. And I'll conclude on this point, because here's what we also hear. Look, we know lots of kids are struggling with the internet capability. They don't have the best connection, right? They're in a household where we might have four or five people who are trying to get access to the internet. The internet connection is weak. What we have been told is this. If your internet connection is not strong, one of the ways that you can help to hold on to some strength in your internet connection is to do what? Turn off the cameras. So if turning off the cameras helps me to keep a stronger internet connection, then please, 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 let's go with it. Stop fighting our kids on this issue around cameras. I had a teacher in another state just two days ago got into this big back and forth with me about why she thought having the cameras were having the cameras off was a problem. She's having this conversation with me while she has her camera off. And so I'm like, well, why is it okay for you to have your camera off, but yet you can't have a situation where your students can have? But so anyway, that's it. Just stop it on that. And discipline as pertains to cameras is not the fight we want to, it's not the fight we want to have, okay? So let's think about this discipline. Let's be sensitive to the fact that kids have a lot going on, which I'll talk about in a second, about how we have to be sort of thoughtful and more sensitive to that, okay? Uh, I'm getting sidetracked. Teacher quality is another way we have to think about this. Folks, we have to do a better job, leaders, because all too often we put our most inexperienced, most underqualified students with our um, most we put our most underqualified teachers with our most needy students. That's not equity, folks. Uh, we take the students who need more, who are struggling and behind, and we give them the teachers who really are still trying to find their, their place and get their grounding as educators. Let's be more intentional about how we can be uh, sensitive, thoughtful, aware of the ways in which teacher quality, and I, every school, all of your schools have some phenomenal teachers, right? Make sure we find ways to put our strongest teachers with our students who have some of the greater needs. And I know teachers are going to push back. I know teachers are going to say, I don't want to have those sort of really demanding students. But this is where we need to really make sure we are trying to do everything in our power to try to impress upon our teachers that when they have strong skill sets and they have strong instructional repertoire and they know how to, uh, sort of to increase the level of rigor, we need to have them with our students who are struggling. Because we're seeing more and more of our students, as you all know, are suffering from learning loss because of this pandemic, and we're gonna see more of our children who need our time and attention, okay? Um, counseling is a big deal, and this one is one I continue to be blown away by. One of my doctoral students, um, uh, one of my doctoral students uh, just brought this up yesterday. Uh, look, folks, California has one of the worst student to counsel ratios in the entire nation. Though we've gotten better, we still, I mean, LA Unified, I think is something like 750, 770 students, every one counselor. Um, <clears throat> we have to figure, and these are just guidance counselors, folks. I'm not talking about social workers and therapists. I maintain in this, in this moment, 
we're going to have to do something different because of the needs our students have, and I'll come to that in a second. So counseling, counseling, counseling for students academically, and more important with mental health, and I'll touch on that in one second. And relationships, <clears throat> relationships, relationships, relationships are important. So let me come to these last two points real quick on counseling and relationships, okay? Um, let's skip there. Let's talk here real quick, folks. Let's stop for a second, because one of the things we need to start talking about, and I've been saying this over the last several months, it is time for us to have a long, hard conversation about mental health, uh, because we have found during this moment, um, the number of young people who are struggling is, is growing considerably. Uh, look, folks, here's what we're finding out. The number of young people who are suffering from social isolation, um, anxiety, loneliness is increasing um, significantly. Um, we also know that even when we come out of this pandemic, whenever that might be, the effects of these last seven months are not going to just disappear right away, that the effects of, of this moment will be with some of our students for years. And I say that because we don't tend to have real hard conversations about mental health in our communities. Uh, I think in many communities of color, uh, mental health issues are seen as taboo. We've got to stop that. Uh, we need to start talking about mental health because mental health issues are real. And we know now that Suicide is the second leading cause of death of young people between the ages of 10 and 24. 10 and 24. And our refusal to have these conversations is part of the problem. I grew up in a household, like many of you, where my father oftentimes stressed to me, my brother, stop crying, man up, uh, don't be weak. These are some really, really destructive messages to send to children. I'm also concerned because if you look at the data from the Center for the Disease Control that has looked at youth suicide and youth suicidal behaviors just in the last six months, three groups, we're seeing significant upticks in terms of suicide ideation or actual committing of suicide. It's our boys, it's our black students, and, our, and it's our LGBTQ youth, three groups. Boys, black youth, and LGBTQ youth. Now, you might ask why those three groups, and that's what lots of folks are trying to figure out, but to me, it really doesn't take a whole lot of, sort of deep dive. With our LGBTQ youth, you can imagine why there's an increase in suicide over the past six months, because for many of our LGBTQ youth, home supportive space. Home is not always the most understanding space. For many of our LGBTQ youth, schools, teachers, principals, and administrators were their saving grace, were the only folks who knew and understood them. So part of what we have to recognize and understand is the fact that for our LGBTQ youth, there's been perhaps a complete disconnect with them and their support. We need to be mindful of that. Why are we seeing a spike in the suicide rates of our boys? Again, that doesn't take a lot to sort of understand and I mean, a lot to unpack. We have to understand that, 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 that toxic masculinity still reigns supreme in our neighborhoods and our, in our country and that boys are given a message that is just deeply, deeply troubling. Boys are not oftentimes given the permission to feel. They're not given the permission to hurt. They're not given the permission to say, I am not doing well. We have to create an environment that tells boys it's okay to say, I'm not okay. It's okay to say that I need help. It's okay to say I am angry. It's okay to say that I am struggling right now. Because if we don't give boys permission to feel, then that explains why so many of our young boys are oftentimes angry, despondent, sad, full gamut. And for, for black youth, we might ask, why is the issue around suicide so prevalent of late? Is because, again, I can speak for this, but in many segments of the black community, we see mental health issues as a sign of weakness. We see it as you are crazy. We see it as something's wrong with you. We see it as uh, you need to just pray on it. And I'm all for prayer, believe you me, but sometimes you can pray and also get professional help. So we have to start manifesting what talking about mental health looks like. Uh, we need to start making it okay for young people to say that if I'm not really in a good space that I can say that and won't be judged because the reality is struggling. Let me just be frank for one second. If we as the adults here on this call, if we had to just say something in the last six months, have we had a moment? Have we had a moment or two where we've just been really, really just like, it's been like, this is hard right now. I am struggling. I mean, just put in the chat if you have over the last six months, if you've said, you know what, 
this is this is really this is really hard. This is this is heavy. I'm struggling. Uh, I'm sad. Uh, I'm worried. Oh, next, uh, I don't know if I can get through the week. I mean, if we're just being fully, fully transparent on this, I know I have had moments. And look, and we, I've got a roof over my head. I've got food to, to eat. I've got family. So we have felt this at times. We can only imagine what some of our students have felt because, when, you know, when things shut down, we are out of our domain. Here's the bottom line, folks. We are all social beings and we are disconnected from our social connections. It is hard. It is difficult. It is challenging. So I'm just talking mainly mental health as real issues. I say that because as we look further, not only is mental health an issue, but now we're looking at a spike in homelessness. I mentioned the spike in homelessness because we have a report that we're going to be issuing next week that's looking at homelessness here in the state of California and in particular at Los Angeles County. What the pandemic has done, as you all know, lots of families have lost employment, jobs have been uh, lost, and when jobs have been lost, we know financial issues become more of a challenge. And even though we have these eviction moratoriums, there are still accounts of families being put out. Even when the moratorium is lifted, we'll probably see a spike, a tremendous spike in homelessness. But even as we look at homelessness rates across LA County, we still see some unevenness with it. We see that black folks still are more likely to be in situations where they experience homelessness compared to other racial groups in LA County. So when you have young people who are not able to stay awake on the Zoom call, don't want you to see where I'm at, so that's why I keep the camera on because I might be in my, my parents' car, we might be on the street. I'm just asking us to be sensitive to, mindful of, and aware of the realities that far too many of our kids deal with on an ongoing basis. And also recognize that as we're seeing an uh, in, increase in mental health issues, anxiety, depression, bipolar, we're seeing an increase in the number of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and so are getting data from the CDC that says that this is not just a kid's issue, but the number of adults who are reporting struggling with mental health or substance abuse is also increasing. That what one in three adults report suffering some kind of anxiety or depression and the CDC experts say that you can almost assess that for every one person who admits it, there's probably another one who hasn't admitted but is also struggling with that. So that means we're talking about maybe 60% of kids, I mean 60% of adults who are suffering some kind of anxiety or depressive symptoms. That's a lot of people, folks, when you think about that. The other thing we have to recognize, we talked a lot about trauma, stress-related issues are real, um, suicidal ideation also amongst parents and caregivers, and we see also an increase in substance abuse. Let me say, folks, here's the other thing I want you to keep in mind. Over the last couple of months, I've had a number of conversations with uh, Bobby Cagle, who is the Department of Children and Family Services Director, and John Sharon, who is the Director of Mental Health in L.A. County. And we're seeing that mental health issues are affecting not only uh, young people, but affecting adults as well. So one of the things I want to stress to you is really, really check in, check in, check in with your, with your people. Okay, let me close out on this because I keep coming back to this. and I really want to stress this to all my leaders in these times. Okay. You all have seen me share this before. I'm going to share it again because uh, I am worried about my, about our children first and foremost. Um, we also put a lot of focus, increased focus on teacher self-care, but I still think we're not sort of prioritizing the degree to which we need to understand where our leaders are. I had a question, Dr. Howard, <clears throat> while we're waiting on our friends to uh, start to post in the question and answer. Uh, you and Dr. Nagara, Dr. Bishop wrote the uh, Beyond the Schoolhouse report. Great, great work, uh, dug really deep in what, uh, what's affecting our most underserved as it relates to the communities that we live in, the schools that we go to, yep. everything from health and well-being. Do you see any progress that we're making there? I know the report is, is a, a pretty new, but mm -hmm. however, it was well received. Do you see us going in a direction where we can uh, improve equitable outcomes for our black and brown youth, our most underserved? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. Let's just be very explicit for a second about that. that what we did with that report beyond the schoolhouse was to look at there was some accumulation of disadvantage for black students in particular. And one of the things that has frustrated me with Los Angeles, and this is not just an LAUSD thing, this is an LA County thing, is that um, I don't think the kind of attention that we need to give black students is what it should be. 
And I understand that there's this argument that, you know, black students are only, you know, seven, eight percent of the district. But we're still talking about tens of thousands of black students. And I say black students because in, in mostly every academic indicator that we're looking at across the board, black students are at the bottom or very close to the bottom. So we wanted to put a very intentional spotlight on black students uh, to say that we recognize that some of these factors, many of these factors were beyond the schoolhouse, literally. Right. I mean, issues around. Uh, poverty, issues around um, lack of investments in, in communities where black folks are, uh, you know, sort of lack of access to medical care, uh, factors that are beyond the school that we know are real. And, and we, we, we know they have a sort of deep impact on black children. Um, but there are some things that happen within schools that, that we can control. And part of what I've been concerned about is that because of what we saw happen over the past six, seven months with the whole George Floyd Breonna Taylor tragic death, that there was a sort of re renewed conversation around we have to do better to end systemic racism. We have to do better to end anti-black racism. So we were naming anti-black racism for the first time and lots of districts started saying we got to be very intentional about what we do for black students, black teachers, black faculty, black staff. And so there was some ongoing movement in the conversation. The question that I would pose is, have the conversations moved to real action yet? And I'm, I'm not sure about that just yet. I'm not saying that it hasn't happened. I'm just saying I'm not sure if we're seeing the movement happening where we're doing some real sort of strategic um, kinds of moves to have an initiative that targets black learners, an initiative to say that we're gonna put a focus on increasing the number of black teachers, a focus on how we can support black administrators. I just think that we have to be much more um, intentional on, on identifying interventions, strategies, programs, targets that have black children, black care, uh, caregivers as the focus. So that way uh, we can begin to see the talk just doesn't stay as talk, but it stays, it, it transforms into some kind of real action, if that makes sense. No, it does. And thank you for that. Thank you for that. It's important work. And I think that it will, I'm hopeful that it definitely will grow. So thank you so much for that. Mm hmm Okay. I've just been told that there has been Zoom outage. So that was our issue there. Okay. And we appreciate everyone's flexibility. It looks like just about all the participants came back. So thank you to them. Thank you for them. Tells you how important uh, the message is today. Yep. So we yep. did have a couple of questions. We have another question, but I think as we reload, as we reloaded, I'm sorry, uh, the questions disappeared. Does anyone yeah, from the yeah. panel have a question? I can, uh, I still have access to the questions. I'd be happy to share them. Sure, please. please. Dr. Chasen. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, this is one that came in earlier. And it says, I find that some experienced teachers want to have challenging or higher need students. How do we address this resistance? Yeah, I think, I think we need to get to the root cause of why there's resistance in the first place. So much of what I try to impress upon teachers is that we cannot just look at surface level behavior and then have real harsh or punitive reactions. And that's what happens far too often. Typically when students, and this is from all my years of teaching and of watching teachers, typically when you get resistant students, there's a, there's, a, there's a root cause, there's a reason why. And that reason might be, uh, I'm a struggling student. That reason might be that teacher said something to me last week that I still haven't forgotten about. It might be, I didn't have anything to eat last night. It might be I'm in a real difficult situation at home. It might be that the teacher never finds ways to sort of say, you know, complimentary things to me. I think that we have to be able to not be so quick to get pulled into service level behavior when we, we have to remember we're talking to student, children here. They're children. And, and many of our children we know have some complex circumstances and, and complex needs. It requires, and this is the one word I would stress over and over again, is relationships, 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 they matter. The very students who are oftentimes the most resistant in our schools, you can rest assured oftentimes there are teachers who can connect to those students. And the one, the one reason why those teachers are able to connect to those students is because they are able to formulate relationships with them. They listen to them. They learn from them. They try to understand what the home life is. They try to figure out more about what those students' strengths are. So, and understand that relationships are built upon trust. And trust takes time. And I get teachers who get frustrated because a student won't respond to me in the first three weeks. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? For a lot of our young people, 
they are not going to show that they are committed to you in three weeks. They want to see how well will you stay invested in me over three months. So it's earned. It takes time. And I ask teachers to understand you're playing the long game here and you can't look for some immediate kinds of reactions for students who have oftentimes not been done well by adults to just open up to you when they don't know if they're going to be burned again. So yes, students resist. Sometimes that resistance is a form of protection. Nice. Nice. Thank you for that. One more question before we, we close, uh, Dr. Howard. Um, Rebecca Johnson is asking, what resources would you recommend for moving the conversation of equity versus equality? You know, yeah, data, data, and more data. You know, one of the things that we do with schools is we oftentimes take a look at, I ask for their discipline data. And I'm always blown away by when we share their school-wide discipline data, they say, well, where did you get that from? I'm like, this is the data y'all gave me. This is from your school site. And when we do that, we start to say, well, look, here's where you are as it pertains to certain student outcomes, as it pertains to student referrals, as it re refers to incidents. And we start talking about what's the root cause? What explains this? Um, why, why do we see more of one particular group of kids, let's say language learners, not gaining access to gifted and talented programs compared to students who, are, who speak English as their first language? Uh, the root causes behind that begin for us to have a conversation that speak to different pathways, obstacles, and that if you go into a classroom, what, what really good teachers do, they make sure that they are constantly checking on the students who have greater needs. They give them more of their time, more of their attention, more of their presence, more of their, uh, their, their, their words and praise. So I think it comes down to just making sure that if we use data, not to sort of, sort of beat it up use it to beat people up with to say you're not doing your job, but say these are the outcomes. And if you do these case studies of students who are some of our, our more, uh, who are some of our lower performers, we will find that there's more than the story that we might know that explains why equity has to be in place. If a student has not had consistent housing for the past six months, we got to do something different. If a student has been in foster care for the past three years and been in six or seven mm. different placements, that requires us to do something different, right? Uh, if a student we know has been held back three times, that requires something different. And the list goes on. So we've got to do a deeper data dive on our students who are more, uh, who are having difficult outcomes to say that we can't keep doing the same old thing and expect a different outcome. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, thank you for that. Uh, we always want to make sure that we're starting every conversation with that data. You know, today is uh, National Bosses Day, Dr. Howard, and you're talking to over 200 bosses, but one in particular, my boss, the Chief Academic Officer of Division of Instruction, uh, Allison Towery. Before we left, we wanted to give her a chance to say a few words. Allison, you're on mute. Thank you so much, uh, Andres. Dr. Howard, thank you, thank you. Um, with as many accolades as you have as uh, a father, a, you know, a parent, uh, a educator, um, you are the most approachable person um, that I know. And, uh, you know, you and I recently had a conversation that it's just not about what we, it is about what we think and what we feel in our hearts and what we want for our students, but it's also about action. And um, with these kinds of forums, what we really hope to encourage is that ourselves pushing our own system to make changes that we need to for our students and our families. So we really greatly appreciate your time and also the collaboration across departments um, for all of you being here today. Um, and Andre, thank you so much for creating the space for us. Absolutely, and thank you, Allison. Uh, Allison is always holding the charge for us to make sure that we're always thinking around the lens of equity at all times for all of our students, but of course our most underserved. Uh, with that, I want to tell everyone, thank you so much. Again, if you could give a big Zoom thank you to Dr. Howard. What a great, great message today. Uh, we appreciate you so much, Brother Howard, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Appreciate you all. Be well. Must thrive. Pick it up. Thank Have you very good. much, Brother Spicer. Appreciate That's you, Brother. Right. Appreciate you. All right. Y'all be we'll good. All right. Thank you.